Uh, first of all, we want to look at uh, renewable energy integrators, and we call this the reality show because, you know, students in college, uh, they, are, they do lab work, they do homework, they do projects, but the reality part is when you actually have to design something and more importantly, construct, test, and deliver a result. So we call renewable energy integrators this reality show. Now, renewable ener energy integrators, the whole uh, uh, concept of an integrator is somebody that is well-versed in electronics and can look at an entire system from energy efficiency to electrical load analysis and the application of appropriate renewable energy sources uh, such as small wind or photovoltaics and also understands solar thermal for heating and cooling and geothermal systems. We don't get into a debate, uh, you know, some people are very passionate about what is and what isn't, and, uh, you know, some people might look at this wind turbine and say, wow, awesome, it's towering, it's so majestic, and others might uh, complain that it's ruined an otherwise pristine condition. The, um, sorry? We work with uh, Freedom Field Renewable Energy. Uh, they're located on the Rock River. They are a not-for-profit. And it is a technology site. And what's really unique about Freedom Field is right from the get-go, they decided that they were going to do system integration. And they provided a host for a lot of student projects there, both as interns and capstone. Uh, the Freedom Field Renewable Energy uh, building is actually repurposed. It was used originally for drying sludge and now houses uh, a lot of different renewable energy systems. Freedom Field uh, Renewable Energy is all about teaching, learning, and leading. Taking technologies that are uh, present in the world and showing how they can be used to solve local problems. Rock Valley College, about four years ago, came up with uh, a new degree program uh, on renewable energy, and we called it Sustainable Energy Systems, where we looked at uh, solar as a source of renewable energy, wind, uh, wind turbines, which is also produced by solar energy, and then other things like water, in particular we look at uh, microhydro, and then biomass, which is a big component of what happens at Freedom Field. We decided to design uh, what we call hybrid courses, where 50% is online, so students can do their work at home, homework, reading, and limited discussion. And then we also had 50% face-to-face, where the students would come in, get their hands-on lab experience, interact with their professors and, and their fellow students. The Rock Valley program provides a comprehensive overview, where firmly based in electronics, so the people get out, they understand electrical, electronics technology. They concentrate on system design. You know, they're not trying to market like a wind turbine or photovoltaics, they're trying to step back and say, okay, if we go into a customer, small business, a residence, you know, let's look at your energy needs, let's look at your electrical load. Um, the photovoltaics you see in the, the bottom center, uh, most people are aware of that. We concentrate on that as well as small wind in the upper right hand corner. The National Electric Code is on the left, NEC, and even though we're not uh, providing students that are intended to be installers, some opt for that, but they need to understand the National Electric Code because it uh, helps us design safe systems. And then at the far right lower uh, corner you see the smart grid, and that's a technology that's coming and that's going to provide new challenges for all of us because we're going to start looking at real-time electrical pricing meaning that you know we might have to delay running the dishwasher at a certain point in time because the rates are very high and we're going to be responsible for managing uh, our electrical usage we had uh, several projects seven in fact at freedom field uh, they helped acquire the parts and put things together. Uh, one of the projects was a ground-mounted photovoltaic array. Basically, these solar panels produce DC electricity, 
and the students had to convert that to alternating current so they could be grid tied and do all the instrumentation associated with that. Uh, using due diligence, uh, the students went out. We were going to plant this array in the parking lot next to Freedom Field. So the students did what's called a shading analysis using a device called the Solar Pathfinder to find out what the solar resource is at that location. The students had to build the design and build the, the racking system, uh, the frames that were required to support the panels. Uh, if you look at the uh, lower left, you'll see that, gee, there's a lot of angles there and sort of triangles. And the student that was doing the shading analysis took a course in uh, plain trigonometry, <laughs> trigonometry Rock Valley and was pleased and thrilled to be able to actually apply it to figure where locations and angles had to be. The array should be facing south and at uh, our latitude angle of uh, 42 degrees. But if you want to compensate for summer when the sun's higher, we can lower the angle by 15 degrees. And if we want to compensate for the effects of winter when the sun is lower in the horizon, we can again raise the angle by 15 degrees. We had another project, microhydro. Now, what you're seeing is uh, actually an educational panel that uh, was produced by a company called Marcraft. It wasn't in production and needed a lot of work, so they donated it to Rock Valley College. So we had some students who went in and actually redesigned the panel and wrote some lab experiments on it. And we wanted the students uh, in this particular project to understand two very important things. One is called head and the other is flow. Head is the elevation. Uh, when we look at the water that's coming into a water turbine, we need to know the head, which is a measure of potential energy, and then, of course, the flow rate. We had them get out in the creek, and I love the picture on the left. Talk about uh, tenacious students. February, creek is covered with ice. The student broke through the ice so uh, he could find the inlet to the uh, uh, pipe that you see there on the right and his partner actually uh, measured the flow rate. So the student uh, like put a float in one end, the inlet side of the pipe. They knew the dimensions of the pipe, so they could figure the volume of the pipe, and the actually on the other side timed from now until she saw the float. They did an analysis, so they applied theory to practice, and discovered that at point B they could have, in theory, 359 watts of electrical energy. And the students then started researching panels, or no, excuse me, wind, uh, water turbines that would uh, work with the low flow and low head requirements that they had measured. The problem was the turbines that they needed were several thousands of dollars, which exceeded the budget. So they made an appointment with one of our applied physics professors and built their own, designed their own. You see at the far left top side, they actually used a fan to make the uh, blades for the water turbine and manufactured the other parts. They used an automobile alternator with permanent magnets uh, to generate the electrical energy. The right side, you see the prototype that they constructed and then they painted and installed it they came up with 10 watts, and you know, with 359 watts of available power, that's not very efficient, but the, the siting aspect, uh, the whole idea of putting the turbine together, uh, I call it a successful project. And they set the groundwork for future students. We had four variable frequency drives donated to the college from Danfoss. Uh, Danfoss is located in Loves Park, Illinois and they provided these variable frequency drives, which are sometimes called variable speed drives, and they're used to control the speed of AC motors. There is a pump application at Freedom Field, we call it affectionately Pump 10, and basically uh, it was controlling a, a pump to help circulate and provide uh, heating and cooling, and we wanted to improve the efficiency. Uh, right now, the system is, uh, there, there's a valve downstream where they choke the flow, so the pump's either 100% on or off. And they use a valve downstream from the pump to control the flow, which is analogous to using your brake to control the speed of your car. 
So it's not very efficient, there's a lot of energy losses. So we want to apply the variable speed drive to improve the efficiency of the system. Uh, this is a three-phase AC induction motor, very similar to the motor that's on the pump. Dan Foss also donated four motors that are classified as inverter grade, so they can be used at very low frequencies, low speeds, without overheating. And then you see the proud students uh, with their test stand. They constructed a little test box so we could actually try different inputs, electrical uh, inputs to the uh, variable speed drive, so we get a feel for the programming and how to respond with the environment. Green roof. Most of us have heard the term green roof. And Freedom Field also has a green roof in, uh, in addition to its many other systems. The question is, well, what's a green roof all about? Well, first of all, a green roof is supposed to mitigate uh, heat loads, heat islands. Black roofs tend to absorb a lot of heat. In fact, you see a thermal image here, and the, the white parts are actually heat islands, uh, where the roofs are capturing the solar energy and raising the heat load for the building, which causes additional work for uh, air conditioning cooling. A green roof is aesthetic, uh, you know, aesthetically more pleasing. Um, the other thing it offers is it uh, helps mitigate runoff problems when we have like a, a storm. You know, it helps absorb the water rather than just forcing everything to, to uh, be handled by the storm drains. The students, uh, the green roof was in existence, but you know, the question is, well, if we've got a green roof, how well does it perform? You know, it's supposed to reduce the heat load in the building. Does it? If so, how much? Uh, if there is runoff, uh, how much runoff do we have? You know, exactly what's the performance? So the students picked some wireless instrumentation and programmed it so it was interfaced with the data acquisition system at Freedom Field. And they measured the temperature uh, above a black surface of the roof, above the white surface, above the uh, green roof part, and then finally the... Uh, moisture content of the earth in the green roof as well as uh, rain. So we have uh, white roofs at Freedom Field, so they manufactured a black roof so they could take their data and get, draw a comparison. There is another project at uh, Freedom Field. They started experimenting with energy storage. And basically, they're using right now lead-acid batteries, and there's a couple of battery banks. But, you know, it's not just like, uh, you know, gee, I want to be off the grid kind of stuff. It is, how can we um, save energy, store energy, and use it to control our costs when we start looking at demands and real-time uh, pricing? So mode zero is one of the options, uh, which it does nothing, which is always a gave, uh, safe mode. The red unit that you see is actually called a grid-tied inverter. It takes the direct current out of the solar panels, converts it into alternating current that can be connected to the grid. Uh, the yellow unit is a sunny island. Uh, it's also a DC to AC inverter, but it's designed to be used standalone and also provides uh, battery charging. In mode one, the photovoltaics, or PV, feeds the, feeds the uh, grid and load. So we could take the solar energy available on the roof and through the inverter actually then uh, supply AC electrical energy to the loads at Freedom Field. And if the loads are light, uh, actually deliver energy to the grid, which reduces cost. In mode two, we can use the grid to charge the batteries. You know, this might be an option when the sun's not out, so you don't have the solar resource, and the electrical prices, the real-time pricing, when they're, they're low cost, then we could store that energy uh, away in the battery bank and actually sell it back to the utility when the prices are higher. In mode three, uh, the photovoltaics, uh, batteries, and uh, both systems supply the grid. Again, this could be done to shave off peak loads when you know, the, the facility needs a lot of electrical energy and we can reduce the electrical loads and therefore reduce costs. And then photovoltaics can be used to recharge the batteries. If we have a good solar resource, usually when you have energy storage like batteries, that takes priority. You, know, you want to get the batteries up so when the sun's not there, you actually have a storehouse of energy. 
So if we look at a graph, say, of, of uh, load and, and cost, usually in the afternoon, a lot of people are using electrical energy, and that's when pricing tends to be high. And that would be the ideal time to use the stored energy to help reduce the peak demand of your facility. Biomass stove. Now, biomass can be uh, pellets of, of grasses that are dried and compacted or wood. And we had a biomass stove at Freedom Field, but it needed some work. Uh, there were sharp edges that could produce cuts. It wasn't very stable, and it didn't ignite readily. So we had some students that wanted to go after this. They set a target price of $25 and redesigned the stove. They used 20-gauge steel so that they could um, have something that was stout and controllable as far as production. They used a software program called SolidWorks where they actually did the uh, design you see on the far left. Uh, that's how the unit is assembled. They also did some analysis uh, finding center of gravity and some other parameters on the stove. They manufactured to minimize, they designed a manufacturing process to minimize waste. So the, again, the idea was to keep the cost low, the weight low, in fact, the Red Crosses expressed interest in this for delivering to people that have suffered uh, you know, a disaster. And this is the last one. This is a fun project. We had students that decided to come up with a solar-assisted electric vehicle. They actually purchased a, a, a go-kart that had a gasoline engine. They stripped it down, refitted it with an electrical system. And you see the finished unit, uh, the uh, photovoltaics, we had 36 volts DC, 280 watt. The solar panels came from Wangcheng, now known as Universal Solar, manufactured in Rockford. They did all the electronics design. Uh, they came up with the battery chargers, the speed control, the instrumentation, and put not only the unit together, but also the electronics. And you see the, uh, one of our students designed the printed circuit board, came up with a light control, so they have light flashers. Uh, if you've ever seen, um, um, what was it, Knight Rider, I think, with the flashing light on the front, <laughs> they came up with that. It was really, really cool. And there you see the proud students with their final project. I'll conclude very quickly to say that the students in our Sustainable Energy Systems program all have uh, secured employment and uh, this last spring, and, and others have opted to go on and continue their education. So we're very encouraged by the projects, the attitudes of the students. It's a big positive in my mind. Thank you.